All right. Uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, staying as long as you've stayed and for listening in English, which I know must be effortful because I know when I try to listen to things in Russian, it doesn't go very well. So uh, I'm going to uh, do a, a, a talk that might uh, upset some people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But uh, <clears throat> I'm doing it in the spirit of trying to be nice. Um, I have a, a great dreams and aspirations for our craft, and I hope, uh, hope you join me. We have a big problem. We have a management crisis in uh, our world, and we've had it for quite a while. And there's a big problem that managers and developers don't understand testing. And... Uh, that turns out to be a quite serious problem because you can't release a product without developers, but you could release a product without testers. And therefore, the demand for skilled testing is eroding, and there are other factors that are going into that. We have these driverless machines that purport to do testing. And on the top of the mountain, we've got a motivated skilled tester who's being undermined by those machines and by users whose expectations of quality are getting lower and lower and lower, and there's more and more of them. And then we've got shiny automation on the one side, low quality standards on the other. And the software industry has become all excited and all uh, uh, dazzled by not just the tools, but also by the values and practices that are appropriate for stuff that isn't that important. We're fascinated by uh, uh, how Google does things, and how Facebook does things, and how Spotify does things, and uh, I don't want to uh, uh, disparage those companies, except to say that what they're doing is uh, not always consistent with stuff that's really important for our survival, or for our businesses, uh, for our own businesses. Just remember, when you're uh, looking at something on a, a social media site, let's never forget, you're the product. You're the product. Uh, you are not the, uh, um, the user of that software. But people get very excited by that stuff because they see it. Meanwhile, the culture of testing, which has been uh, uh, weakened by trying to turn testers into commodities. What is the ISTQB saying now? 500,000 certified testers. 600,000, maybe it's 700,000, uh, all being evaluated by these trivial and, uh, 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 to my mind, uh, uh, very insignificant uh, examples of bad testing. And then there's all the tools. And uh, a difficulty that I have when I walk around uh, this conference is I'm not hearing people talking about stuff that I'm really interested in. I'm hearing a lot of fascination with the tools and with the technologies. And there's a problem associated with that because uh, what testers do, what we produce, really, most of it is not tangible. You can't point to it the same way you can point to a running program. Uh, what we produce is information, stories, ideas. And there's a problem with that. The problem with that is for people to understand testing work, you have to talk about it, and you have to make it visible, legible, readable. Uh, there's a terrific book called uh, a Seeing Like a State uh, by uh, uh, James Scott, which is uh, about the subject of legibility and this problem that it poses for, for certain kinds of managers. So that leads to yet another problem. And that problem is if we don't talk clearly about testing, we stand a really good chance of, of understating, diminishing, and even undermining the value of the testing craft. And we risk uh, uh, undermining our own positions in testing. And that leads to a big problem. The big problem is that testers, many of them, most of them, I worry, don't know how to, about talk, uh, don't know how to talk about testing. And the even bigger problem is that testers themselves don't understand testing. 
This is a great way to make myself popular, isn't it? Yeah, isn't that, isn't that a great way to, to achieve friends and uh, uh, get warm embraces from people? Here is what's turning me into a grumpy old man. Increasingly, it seems to me that testing is being confused with checking the build to see if all of the uh, uh, coded checks we've got have, are passing. And we're becoming fixated on test, test automation, that is automated checking, and that's causing us to lose our connection with the human and social purposes for which we are doing software development and testing within that software development. Now, I'm not against tools. We have this terrible problem, James and I. Everybody thinks we're against tools. We write tools. We develop tools for our own purposes. We use tools. We love tools. Tools are cool. We should use them. We should use them a lot because we need help from tools. Tools can help us to be powerful, but tools aren't the center of things. What I'm seeing at conferences and uh, on testing forums and in the way people talk about testing really often looks like an attempt to stay away from the product itself to make sure we don't actually interact with it and engage with it. And we don't act interact with our clients or our customers or our mission. And that makes me worried for our craft. The good news, though, is that we can start to address those problems. We can start to address them right here, right now. So I hope you join me in this uh, 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 revolution that we're going to try to start in the testing world. Because we're still partying like it's 1999, folks. We've got to move forward in our business. It starts with bad ideas about what a program is. Um, I was very lucky to uh, work for several years with Kim Kaner, who uh, was the author of Testing Computer Software, the inventor of the term exploratory testing, the author of Lessons Learned in Software Testing, and the author of this wonderful talk that he did called uh, a Software Testing as a Social Science. And in that talk, he laid out a problem that he had experienced as a, a, a professor, a teacher of programming at Florida Institute of Technology. He set himself out a task to create a first-year programming course for people who'd never done programming before. And he went through all the programming books, and what did they say? The programming books said that a program is a set of instructions for a computer. And that bothered Kim a lot. He said that that was a lot like saying that a, a house is a set of building materials arranged in a house design pattern. Where it might be a much better idea to think of a house as something for people to live in. The purpose of a computer program is to deliver value to people. And a, a program is a communication among people. And it's mediated by hardware and software. But he says, get that part wrong. Start talking about a, a program like it's a set of instructions for a computer, and you expose yourself to all the classic problems of computer engineering in the first few minutes of the class. So I saw that, and I was galvanized by it. I thought it was a really wonderful thing. And then, in 2013, James and I met Harry Collins, and Harry was slated to give a talk at uh, the Eurostar testing conference in 2013 where I was a program chair. I only became program chair because I wanted, I, I took the job because I wanted Harry to be uh, uh, introduced to the testing community, and sadly he got sick just before that conference, and so he didn't show up. But he did send his uh, a colleague, Rob Evans, to come and give a talk, and he gave a, a really good talk, but he didn't give the talk I don't think that Harry would have given Harry did provide us with an abstract for that talk, and it is the most powerful thing, most wonderful thing I've heard about software testing. Best description ever, and as usual, of course, it, doesn't come, it comes from somebody who's not involved in software testing. It comes from a non-tester. But Harry really got it right. So I'm going to do something that uh, um, uh, presenters are not supposed to do, which is I'm going to read a slide. Computers and their software are two things, said Harry. As collections of interacting cogs, machinery, they must be checked to make sure that there are no missing teeth and that the wheels spin together nicely. Machines are also social prostheses, he goes on, like artificial arms or, or insulin pumps or artificial hearts, and they fit into human life where a human once fitted. 
And he says it's a characteristic of medical prostheses, like replacement hearts, that they don't do exactly the same thing, uh, the, exactly the same job as the part of the body that they replace. The surrounding body has to compensate for that. And then Harry pointed out that contemporary computers and their software are like that. They don't do just the things that humans do. That, now, they do things that humans with certain kind of superpowers could do, but they don't do them in the same way, and they don't do them with the same social concern, the social um, uh, uh, situation, because they don't fit into society the way people do. So the society has to compensate for the ways in which computers are different from people and the ways in which they fail to do what the people they're replacing do. This means that a complex judgment, says Harry, is needed to test whether software fits well enough for the surrounding humans to happily repair the difference between humans and machines, and this is much more than a matter of deciding whether the cogs spin right. I thought that was just the most magnificent description of what software testing should be like. It's that complex social judgment that's really important. The tools help us, the technologies help us, but that's what's at the center of it, accomplishing this social goal. In other words, is the product that we've got good enough for people to be happy with it? Is the product that we've got the product that we want? That's the question that we're trying to answer when we're testing. Why have testers? Because management wants to know the answer to a question. They want an expert answer to this question. Are there problems that threaten the value of the product or the on-time successful completion of the project? That's all they want to know. All these crazy questions that managers ask us about passing and failing test rates and, and uh, 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 schedules and, and that, uh, the, uh, what, what else do they ask us about? Uh, they ask us about how many test cases we have. All those questions they have are actually proxies for this one, which is, are there problems that threaten the on-time successful completion of the project? That's what managers want to know. And I know that because I've been a program manager. I was a, a program manager for an extremely successful piece of software in the 1990s. That's what I wanted to know from my testers. Are there problems that threaten the value of the project and the product? Now, there are certain kinds of diseases and mistakes that testers make and uh, that other people make too. Testers are not the only ones who make this mistake, but lots of people make this mistake. Reification. Reification. Turning ideas or concepts into stuff. The mistake of believing that the requirements is the same thing as a requirements document. Not right. Some of the requirements are described to some degree in the requirements document. And it's important for testers, as social agents for managers, and social agents for customers, to remember that what's in the requirements document is a fraction of what the requirements for the product after, uh, uh, actually is. After all, you know this. Nobody here has ever read a requirements document that said, after every bullet point, at the end of every bullet point, and the product shall not crash. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that is uh, uh, an aspect of, of uh, testing the product, looking for problems that the requirements don't tell us about. Another problem is misbegotten ideas about quality, the idea that uh, comes from Philip Crosby, that quality is conformance to requirements, but that leaves out an enormous amount of stuff right there. Whose requirements? Whose requirements matter? And whose requirements matter more than other people? Who has the authority to make decisions about requirements? I much prefer Jerry Weinberg's definition of quality, that quality is value to some person, to which James and I add, or persons who matter. Which means that decisions about quality are political and emotional. Political because they're being made by people with the power to make them, and because the decisions about quality start with a decision about whose values matter. Nothing more, more, nothing more political than that. And also, decisions about quality are emotional. Emotional because managers don't make decisions based on the numbers or on logic. 
They make decisions based on how they feel about the numbers, how they feel about the logic. They want to appear rational. They want to appear rational. Want, appear. Who's driving the bus there, rationality or emotion? So we are creatures of politics and emotion, and uh, quality is, is decided based on those kinds of things. That, in turn, leads to the idea that quality, testing is about quality control or quality assurance or that testers are quality gatekeepers. Nope. We are not. We can't assure quality. We don't have the political power to do that. And the conflict between that title, quality assurance, and what we're actually capable of doing causes great confusion and great pain. Testers uh, don't have the authority to make decisions about the product, and yet... Testers are often held responsible when the product ex escapes with bugs. So we've got to get clear about defining what our role is and the extents and limitations of what we're able to do. Testing isn't about quality control. Testing is about exploring and investigating and reporting on risk. That's what testing is about. Now, if we're talking about risk, it would seem to me to have a, a, be a good idea to have deep models about risk. And many of the problems uh, uh, that I've uh, seen uh, being examined at, at this conference and in others are focused on the problem that there might be an error somewhere in the code. And the testing strategies are focused on that. But, in fact, there could be many problems in the relationships between people and the product. Many problems. Many sources of risk. So in rapid software testing, we try to dive deep. We were given a mission by Jerry Weinberg several years ago to, to go deeper on, on everything that we found. So here is what we might think of in terms of risk. Some person or persons, like a user, a customer, a developer, a tester, a business person, a bystander, or a group of people like a company, an organization, a, 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 a business, a society at large, a community, will experience, that is to say, they'll, they'll, they'll get affected, they'll feel it in the context of an event or a situation at least once by a problem, a problem that leads to bad feelings of some kind, like confusion or annoyance or frustration or impatience, or to loss or to harm, or to diminished value in some way, with respect to something that they want. A quality criterion, an attribute uh, like capability, or reliability, or performance, or usability. And that problem can be detected sometimes by a feeling, a principle, or a tool, or a, a comparison to a, a document, or to a picture, or to a specification, uh, a line, or a conversation. In some set of conditions, maybe sometimes, maybe always, because of a vulnerability, a weakness in the product, like a bug, or a feature, or an inconsistency, that is in the system someplace in some part of the system, in some component of the system. So that means as testers, it behooves us to think about deep models of the product and of the context and of the testing. It behooves us to think about what a problem is, what the quality criteria for the product might be, what oracles we might use to detect problems in the product, the conditions under which we might make problems visible to ourselves, and theories of error by which we would uh, uh, identify vulnerabilities in the product and the various factors of the product, all in service of stakeholders. And we can have lots of models of those too. When we're not focused on risk, the mission gets mistaken. It gets uh, trained on the idea that testing is showing that the product works. But that's not what testing is about. Testing is learning about the product. That's interesting. That's an oddly strange way to spell about, isn't it? Uh, searching for problems, finding them, reporting on them, letting our clients know about them so they can make informed decisions about whether the product is good enough or whether we want to fix the product or change it in some way. Testing is about confirming, uh, confirming the product works? Nope. 
It's about discovering how the product doesn't work or how the product might not work in ways that matters to our clients. Testing is about confirmation. It's not. Testing is about investigation, exploration, discovery, learning. Testing is about building confidence, some people say. No, it's not. It's not about building confidence. Not for testers. For testers, testing is about demolishing unwarranted confidence. It's finding all the little ways that our clients might have reason not to have confidence in the product. The confidence building part, that's their business. If you want confidence, go to a programmer or go to a marketer. That's not our job. It's not our job to provide our clients with quality reassurance. Ryan Merrick one time said that testing is about reducing damaging uncertainty about the product. And I, I appreciate what he's trying to say, but I, I'm afraid I don't agree. The testing is not about reducing damaging uncertainty, it's about preserving appropriate skepticism. It's our job as testers to be professionally uncertain when everybody around us is sure that everything's okay. Testing is about button pushing. Button pushing can be done more quickly by machinery, so why do we get testers to do it? Testing isn't about button pushing, it's about learning. And learning can only be done by humans who have intentions, who have desires to learn, who have uh, uh, social obligations to fulfill. But tools can still be powerful aids to testing. They're just not in the center of it. So let's call this checking, not testing. Uh, Distinction I started to introduce uh, and uh, start shouting about in uh, 2009, and I'm, I'm kind of pleased to see how it's actually made its way around the world. Maybe uh, I will have done something useful by the end of my uh, uh, career. Checking is not, uh, as I originally cast it, I did make a, a couple of mistakes in the way I was expressing it. Checking is not uh, 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 confirming that the product works, not exactly. With uh, James's help in 2013, we, we finally came up with a, a sharp way of putting this. The testing is operating a product algorithmically to check specific facts about it, which means operating the product and observing it algorithmically in specific algorithmic ways to collect specific observations algorithmically and then to apply algorithmic decision rules to those observations, and then algorithmically to report the outputs or the outcomes of those evaluations. Do you think there might be a key word up here that I'm trying to emphasize? Is there any possibility that there's something that is important about checking? Checking is the part of testing. It's a part of testing that can be subject to algorithms, which means, like a spelling checker, what it means is, a check can be performed, at least in theory, by a machine that can't think, but which has the virtue of being quick and precise, or by a sufficiently disengaged human being. Those of you who were here yesterday uh, uh, saw me describe this. I want to emphasize something really important. Note that quick and slow here refer to behaviors, to calculations, to things that move, that are visible, they don't refer to recognizing unanticipated trouble. So a machine is infinitely slow at doing that. If the machine is going to recognize a problem, it has to be programmed to recognize the problem. Machines won't spontaneously identify a problem on their own with the possible exception, I suppose, of crashing. But even then, the human has to come along and observe that the machine is in a crash state. Now, checking is all right. Nothing wrong with checking. But it's mostly focused on confirming what we know already, what we hope to be true. To understand our products and the risk that they pose to value and to people, we have to do more than that. We have to test. We have to embed testing. Uh, we have to embed checking, rather, inside testing. So testing is, oh, it includes operating a product to check it algorithmically. But it's so much more than that. Testing is evaluating a product by learning about it, by studying it, by questioning it, by modeling it, learning about it through exploration and experimentation, designing experiments, generating ideas for those experiments, elaborating on those ideas, refining the ideas that we've elaborated on, overproducing ideas, 
Abandoning ideas that we've overproduced. Recovering ideas that we've abandoned. Revisiting ideas. Collaborating with other people. Navigating through the product. Making maps of it. Manipulating it. Perturbing it. Creating tools. Resourcing tools. Identifying expertise. All of these things that machines cannot do. All these things that you need real people like you and me to do. Making observations and conjectures and inferences. And testing is even more than that. Testing is creating the conditions necessary for doing all that stuff so that our clients can make informed decisions about risk. And in fact, testing is even more than that. Testing is acquiring the skill and the reputation and the desire, the inclination, the motivation for creating the conditions necessary for evaluating a product by learning about it through exploration and experimentation, which includes checking. I'm very worried about our, our uh, um, obsession with checking in our business. I'm worried about that being an obsession. Checking's okay. But let's not become fixated on it. Testing is about learning so that, hey, maybe we can help make the product better too. Why is it important to make this distinction? Because checking is mechanistic. We can make it explicit. We can make it automated. But it's inside testing. It's a tactic of testing. Nobody confuses biting and eating, right? Nobody confuses biting and eating. That's what checking and testing is like. Nobody confuses compiling and programming either. Nobody confuses compiling and programming. That's biting. This is eating. Now, of course, biting can be mechanized. Yeah, we can do automated biting or a different kind of automated biting maybe. But ta testing involves tacit knowledge. It involves social skills. And they can't be encoded. We can't express those things as code. They have to be developed. They have to be developed through practice and through socialization, through interacting with other people. And they have to be practiced and developed as expressed as increasingly challenging work. It can't be done by rote procedure. We learn as we test. And efficiency and effectiveness are very different uh, things to talk about when we're talking about the difference between explicit and tacit skills. There's certain kinds of uh, 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 tacit knowledge that we can't even express because they're changing too fast and they don't exist inside even a single human head. They exist in the relationships between people. And for, for checking to be truly excellent and truly valuable, it's got to be embedded in testing, in excellent testing, for it to be valuable. And programmers have got around this for years and years and years. Programmers get around this. They don't talk about automated programming. There's compiling. Compiling's a part of programming that humans used to do. But then somebody figured out, oh, we can write a program to do that. But nobody says, oh, well, now that we've got, no, our jobs are under threat because we have automated programmers. Nobody talks like that. We shouldn't talk like that either. There's no such thing as automated testing. No such thing as automated testing. Checking can be automated, but testing cannot. There's no such thing as automated editing. Spell checking can be automated. Even grammar checking can be, editing, uh, can be automated. Editing cannot. It's really unhelpful, I think, as a craft for us to talk about manual testing as though it were something less sexy or less glamorous because testing is neither manual nor automated. Testing is testing. We use tools when we test. This is unremarkable. Nobody should be uh, uh, surprised at the fact that testers use tools. It's a normal, natural, ordinary thing for testers to use tools, just like it is for other people. Nobody does manual doctoring. Nobody does manual parenting. Nobody does manual research. Nobody does manual management. Nobody ever asks, How much of, uh, what percentage of your management cases are automated? Nobody ever asks that. 
But there does seem to be a problem because when I talk about testing, it doesn't take very long before some tester starts talking to me about test cases. We write test cases. Passing test cases show product good. Failing test cases, bad. No. Testing is not about test cases. Testing is not about artifacts. Testing is not about correctness. It's not about pass-fail. Skill testing focuses on two much more germane, much more important questions. Testers ask themselves this. Is there a problem here? As I'm interacting with the product, I'm asking myself all the time, every minute, every second, is there a problem here? Is there a problem here? And I'm also imagining my clients, my stakeholders, watching me as I'm bumping into obstacles, as I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, against some of the dynamics of software development. What I'm asking them is, are you okay with this? Because, you know, uh, obstacles, I can handle obstacles. I can deal with obstacles, but they will make my testing harder or slower, which gives bugs more time and more opportunity to hide. You guys okay with that? I mean, I'm not, I'm not really happy about it, but if you're okay with that. These are the questions that we ask as, as skilled testers. Remember, management wants to know, are there problems that threaten the value of the product or the on-time successful completion of the project? And any obstacles that we run into as testers, those are reportable when we need help to get them solved so that bugs don't get the chance to survive. We have some pretty shallow approaches to strategy and testing sometimes, right? We read the specs and then we write test cases. That's how people express what they're going to do as testers. Excellent test strategy requires rich models, deep models, lots of diversity, uh, focused on the project context, on quality criteria, on project factors, on oracles by which we would recognize problems and test techniques. Like this. I'm going to do this without looking. I'm going to do this without looking. When I enter a product, oh, I'm not supposed to do that because of the light. Right, there we go, okay. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. I'll look straight up. When I encounter a, product for, uh, a project for the first time, I have questions about the mission, about the information that's available to me, developer relations, who are they, where are they, how many are they, what, uh, who do I get along with, testers, uh, the test team, who's on it, where are the skills we got, what are the skills we need. Uh, I uh, ask about uh, the equipment and tools, I ask about schedule, test item, deliverables, and then I look at the product elements, the product factors, I consider the structure of the product, the functions that it performs, the data that it operates on, the interfaces by which we get data in and out of the product, Product. I look at the platforms upon which the product depends. I look at the operations that people perform with the product, the way people get stuff done with the product, and I look at time. Then I think about quality criteria like capability, usability, reliability, charisma, security, scalability, compatibility, performance, installability, and then development-related quality criteria like supportability, testability, maintainability, portability, and localizability. And then... Then, I think about the test techniques that I'm going to apply. The test techniques that I'm going to apply include scenario testing and claims testing and user testing and, uh, oh, scenario, no, 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 no. That's, Function testing, domain testing, stress testing, flow testing, scenario testing, claims testing, user testing, risk-based testing, and automated checking. And then I think about the oracles. Now, I'll give you a list of the principles. The principles are Pa uh, patterns of familiar problems. If I see one like that, I suspect that it's a problem here too. But then I also look for inconsistency with explainability, with the world, with history, with image, with claims, with comparable products, with user desires, which are uh, incorporated in the quality criteria, with the product itself, with purpose, with standards and statutes. And I also think in terms of artifacts and documents. I think in terms of feelings that people have. I think in terms of uh, opinions held by people who matter. I have this network that looks like this. That's what testing looks like for me. So when somebody comes along, oh, thank you. <laughs> but you can do that too. You can do that too. And in fact, you shouldn't use our model. Oh, you can if you want, but whatever model you use, you've got to own it. You've got to develop it. And See, when you can talk about this like a pro, the amateurs won't hassle you, right? When your manager says, but we have to write test cases, and that's what my manager says. 
managers resort to that kind of shit and bogus metrics when their testers don't speak authoritatively, like they know what they're talking about. When you can talk about this stuff like a pro, like a professional, then the amateurs won't give you any crap. And you can do it too. You can do it too. So, testing is all about test cases? Nuh-uh. A test is not an artifact. It's not a few lines of uh, uh, instructions or a few lines of code. A test is a performance. Just like that, that stuff with lines and dots on it, that's not music. That's notation for performing music. But until a string gets plucked, until a bow runs over it, until somebody blows air through a tube, until somebody whacks something with a mallet, so sound happens and the air starts to vibrate. Until then, no music happens. So the test is not the test case. The test is what you think and what you do. It's a performance. Pilots don't use piloting cases. Hey, oh, look, here's the parents and the researchers and the managers. They don't use cases. There's no management cases. There's no piloting cases. There's no doctoring cases. Why are we the only craft I can think of that reduces its complex cognitive work down to something as dopey as cases? That's not us. We can be so much more than that. Here's why I want to resist it, because testing is about exploration, experimentation, discovery, learning, investigation, reporting. And test cases drive us towards output checking, human checking, confirmation, demonstration, showing that something works, which psychologically is really bad, because if we are seeking to show that something works, we're not going to see the problems in it. We're going to start reporting problems that we have in the scripts, but not in the product. It's an experiment that we run in class all the time. Uh, we give people a list of instructions to follow, and they miss really obvious bugs. Then there's something even worse, that when people start thinking in terms of test, getting, test cases and artifacts, they start counting them. And then all of a sudden, we start to lose information. We start to distort the goals of testing, which is to tell a story about the product. And instead, we uh, uh, frame things in terms of meeting the numbers. So, uh, a couple of uh, yesterday, uh, one tester came up to me and asked, "But what, what do we do if we don't have test cases? We can use the information in tables. We can use coverage outlines that give us a, a, a list and a, a breakdown of the factors that we might want to cover in our testing." We can use open procedures, not specifically step-by-step, step, do this, do this, do this, do this, and then observe that, but sets of things for testers to do, a performance for them to uh, 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 perform, but not one that is tightly structured, not one that is narrowly procedurally structured, but open procedures. And sometimes extremely specific test design matters. So in those cases, we give them instructions references, we give them a, a, a design, and we design that very carefully to uh, reveal certain kinds of information, certain kinds of observations that we want to make about this system, focused on learning about it, focused not on a predicted result, not on an expected result, but with open expectations so that we can start to see new patterns in, in a way that I, I described a little bit at the talk yesterday. Concise charters, little one-line to three-line sentences describing what a tester could do during a session, an uninterrupted session of testing. Interview the product manager and ask the product manager about particular concerns. Talk to a developer about the changes that they made. Read through the use cases. Oh, read through the use cases and invent misuse cases. Abuse cases, ways in which people might fox themselves uh, using this product problems that people might run into. Uh, generate a, li a library of mind maps. Generate a library of scenarios. Uh, generate a, a library of situations. Create a set of factors that we might want to examine as we're testing. Talk to the subject matter experts about what they actually do during their work that this program is intended to represent and learn about that. Learn about that system. And then take those ideas and feed them into ideas for deep coverage sessions. Run through those scenarios that are in the scenario playbook. 
Uh, I had a wonderful conversation with uh, Andre, I think it was, uh, just before uh, this talk, where he talked about some wonderful stuff that uh, he's doing with uh, estate machines and using state machines uh, as a, a means of exploring the product more deeply, not to confirm how the product is working, but to learn deeply about how the product does its thing. Follow a bit of data from cradle to grave. And don't think about boundary testing as some stupid plus one, minus one ISTQB thing. Think about discovery of hidden boundaries. Think about discovery of, of interesting changes or confusable sets. Develop scripts that do not simply do the same thing over and over again, but induce a lot of variation. Put in a lot of forward and backward stuff. Put in error conditions and see how the re machine responds to those errors under load, under stress, to see if we get cascades of uh, uh, activity when the machine starts to try to process or compensate for errors. Look for error message hangovers. Maybe you're working in an organization where you're bringing on new testers and they say, how will the new testers learn without test cases? What you do is you give them an assignment. You tell them a little bit about what they're supposed to do and then you say, go try to do this and tell me about any problems that you find because fresh eyes find failure. When they try to do something, they'll learn how to do it. When they learn how to do it, they'll stumble into problems that represent things they need to learn or actual problems in the product. So we give them ideas on what to do, we give them ideas on what to observe and how to recognize problems, we give them ideas for variations, and we give them those in a one-pager rather than a whole booklet of step-by-step -step, step procedures where we're trying to automate them and turn them into robots. This re-engages people with testing. It makes sure that, that the people have their hands on and their eyes on and their minds on the product instead of trying to uh, look at it at a distance. Next thing I see is a problem for testers sometimes is that we fail to tell the testing story. We focus it on uh, bug reports. But in fact, the testing story has three parts. A story about the product, a story about how you tested it, and a story about the quality of that testing. Three stories that weave around each other like a braid what the product is, what it does, how it works, how it doesn't work, how it fails, how it might fail in ways that matters to our clients. That's a story about bugs. But we also have to tell a story about how we got that first level story. What do we do to set the product up, to run it, to observe it, to interact with it? How do we recognize problems and the significance of those problems in the product? That's a story about oracles. And something that testers, I fear, are, are pretty bad at, unfortunately. What we've covered so far and what we have not covered yet and what important testing remains to be done, what testing we won't do at all unless something changes in the test strategy, in the schedule, uh, in the resources that we uh, have available to us, in the people that we're working with. What's not going to get covered? Because what's not going to get covered, that's where the risk lives. And then we also have to tell a story about anything that threatens the value of our work. A story about how good our testing was. Anything that got in the way of it, anything that made it harder or slower, anything that made it less valuable, anything that might allow bugs to survive undetected, and what we need in order to fix that situation. At our client's option, so that we can produce better testing results for them. That's a story about issues. Coverage is a really essential thing, and I don't think uh, uh, we're, we're that great at it just yet. Uh, the idea is that the testing story is about how many test cases we've run, counting things again. Nuh-uh. The testing story is about what we've covered so far and what else we could cover so that in collaboration with our clients, we can focus our testing on the stuff that matters to them, where the risks are. How do we report on that? Well, after sessions of testing, test leads and test managers and clients get together and they talk about the proof that was obtained. Past, what happened during the session. Results, 
What were the outcomes of the testing? What was achieved? What got covered? Obstacles, what got in the way? What made things harder? What slowed things down? Outlook, what, what should we look at next? What, would she, we, uh, what should we focus on next? And feelings, how does the tester feel about this? Because we use our feelings as testers, if we're smart about it, because our feelings are like alarm systems for the rest of our cognitive process. Our feelings tell us things that we should pay attention to. If we're going to do this well, we need good lab notes. Oh, and logging tools and logs, they help a lot as well. So, having taken the coverage outline that we've got, we can identify things that we have looked at and that we have only looked at a little bit and that we haven't looked at at all and bring that question back to our clients again. Are you okay with all this? So the testing becomes a collaborative enterprise with the people that we're working for and that we're working with. More alternatives. Lots of different kinds of reporting, lots of different forms of reporting. Lots of ways of framing it, lots of ways of organizing it, lots of ways of, of displaying output. The managers will forget about test case style documentation when we give them something better, but it's up to us to do that because they're not going to discover it on their own. It's up to us to study testing and, and, and what our colleagues in the, in the business are doing in order to visualize output reports, in, in, in order to uh, uh, illustrate things with uh, statistical output, in order to use tools to tell the story of our testing. Here's another thing that testers fall victim to, this silly idea that we have to run every test again after every build. That is a sign that we're not working with a risk-focused test strategy. That we don't know enough about the product to make choices about what kind of tests we're going to perform. What kind of tests would be a good idea to repeat and what kind of tests would be unnecessary to repeat, useless to repeat, unimportant. And if you're worried about regression, use that feeling. That feeling is trying to tell you something. If you're seeing a consistent pattern of regression and you're worried about it, the problem is probably not failing checks. No, no particular bug that you're finding is the big problem. The big problem is that you've got a regression-friendly environment, an environment where regression problems are happening a lot. And if they're happening a lot, testing isn't going to fix it. Testing will detect some regression bugs, but not all of them. The rest of them will get through. The real problem here is that the programmers are probably working too quickly to understand what's actually going on in the project. And if that's the case, that's a severity one project risk, severity zero project risk. Work together with our colleagues, the programmers, to report on that. That's ramping up risk in a way that is going to damage the enterprise in the end. There's a kind of learned helplessness with some testers some testers say, I can't code, nobody will hire me. Well, there are a couple of ways of getting around that problem. One is, you haven't learned to code yet. You could learn to code. It's not that hard to write a bit of useful code. It's not that hard to learn how to do that. Not to be a production coder, that's difficult. That takes a lot of skill, and there's a lot of risk associated with that. But to write little programs that do little things that can help you out, not too hard. But there's another way you can get around the problem of not coding. As James, colleague, uh, James Bach, my colleague, says, if you can't code, you have two choices. You can learn to code, or you can learn to be charming. You could develop expertise in other aspects of testing, and then use your social superpowers to charm programmers into helping you when you need tools or to persuade the organization that you need the help of a toolsmith on the test team to help you develop and maintain tools. <sighs> Testers express fear of the certification monster. I don't have a certification, nobody will hire me. I don't think that we should be paying taxes to governments that weren't elected. And so uh, here's what I suggest for those testers. Put on your resume, 
I am not ISTQB certified, and I'm happy to explain why. That'll get you through the mechanical filter that sorts through, right? There, there, there's that, they got that tool that sorts through, looks for ISTQB somewhere in the CV. And so you go into the, okay, let's interview them pile. And then maybe somebody will look at that later on and say, not, so you, uh, get rid of them. Don't bring them in here. That's fine. You didn't want to work there in the first place. If that's all they're making the decision based on, they're not interested in you. They're just interested in five letters. I've got four letters for them to compensate. AI will replace us. AI will never replace us. It's okay. And let, until AI replaces humans generally, and we all decide that we're going to, I don't know, walk into Kilauea and burn ourselves up, AI will not replace us. Everybody take it easy. AI stands for algorithm improvement. It doesn't stand for artificial intelligence. And if you think it stands for artificial intelligence, think about artificial. Think about artificial turf or artificial sweetener or artificial Christmas tree. And then think how that applies to artificial intelligence. And if people are going to use it, they're going to need us. Because artificial intelligence is going to need a hell of a lot of testing. It's going to need some very clever testing. Tools are just for GUI checking, right? No. Tools are for lots of stuff. For producing test data, obfuscating or cleaning production data for privacy reasons, generating interesting combinations of inputs, generating and representing state and flow models, setup, configuration, environment management, submitting transactions, automated checking, creating mocks and simulators, probing the internals, monitoring the interfaces, sorting, filtering, parsing, visualizing internal consistency, applying oracles, performing statistical analysis, recording activities, documenting procedures, preparing reports, presenting reports, mapping strategies, identifying coverage, organizing time and effort, retaining information. <sighs> Testers get in trouble sometimes when they try to answer questions that other people should be answering. When will the testing be done? Testing is done when managers decide that it's done, when they're satisfied that there's no more important development work to be done. It's like me getting onto the plane and saying, when is the flight attendance phase going to be done? There's a flight attendance phase at the end of the flight, right? No, that's not how flight attendance works. Flight attendance starts before anybody gets on the plane and it ends only after everybody's off it. It's like the driving, people talk about the testing phase. How long is the testing phase going to take? Well, that's like talking about going to Moscow and saying, you know what, we're going to have an eight-hour driving phase and then a one-hour looking out the window phase to see if we're where we're at. No, that's not the way you drive. We drive by looking out the window and looking at the dashboard and gathering information from all around us for the whole trip, starting at the beginning and going right to the end. So testing stops and development stops. Testing is never done. It only stops. Testing stops when managers decide they've got enough information to make a shipping decision. And the way we can make that work smoothly is to go to them every day and say, here's what we know. Here's some things that we don't know yet. Are you okay with that? Now, the things testers do is they fall into the measuring quality trap. How should we measure quality? You do not, as a tester, have to answer a question that's not going to help. You can measure attributes that might have a bearing on quality, but you can't measure quality itself. Quality can't be measured. But here's what you can do. You can report on it, and you can discuss it. You can assess it. What metrics should we use? No metrics. There are metrics for certain things that we could gather, but don't worry about it. What managers want is not really metrics. They want evidence. So present evidence. If somebody asks you for a number, offer them a list. Offer them a list. How many bugs are there in the product? Not an interesting question. Here's a list of the 10 most important problems that I perceive in the product. Oh, and just in case I'm wrong about what your top 10 would be, here's another 10. So measuring quality, counting test cases, counting bugs, bad idea. Here's another one. Testers shouldn't rock the boat. Can't we all just get along? Controversy is going to come with the testing job. Effective testing is socially disruptive. 
We're taking the beautiful baby that the developer developed, and we're saying, um, it's a little ugly. <laughs> we have to learn to do that compassionately. As Jerry Weinberg says, the default stands for a, tes uh, stands for a tester, the default emotional uh, stance, empathy. Don't misrepresent what you do. I break the software. No, you don't. The software is broken when you got it. We don't break anything. We do break something. We break illusions about the software. We break dreams. And it's important not to say I break the software. It's important not to say it because you face a public relations problem when you do it. Others may repair that. They, they, with that idea of repair that Harry Collins had, meaning fix up a communication. And they fix it up in their own way. Well, the software was fine until the testers broke it. We could ship on time if the testers would just stop breaking the product. Customers would love our product, but not the testers. They keep breaking it. There are no systemic management or development problems here now that lead to problems in the product. No, it's just that the testers keep breaking it. Don't say, I break the software. I break illusions, I break dreams. Testing is about preventing problems. I'm hearing that one a lot from Agilists and Agile teams. Testing isn't about preventing problems. Development is about preventing problems. Testing helps development. Testing is about discovering problems that development didn't prevent. At review time, in an idea. At uh, design time, in a design. Testing is not about preventing problems. Earlier in development, testers can help by anticipating risks and problems in a way that helps developers and designers to prevent them, but we don't prevent problems. And I believe it's important to say that because it's important for us not to say I prevent problems because when you say I prevent problems, you're probably overreaching. You don't have the authority to prevent problems, neither do I, not as a tester. And it's important for us to honor the role of the people who do have that power, who do have that authority, and to remain humble about our role. We don't put the quality in. They do. We help them put the quality in. Problems occur because of a variety of factors. Same is true of prevention of problems, right? So I can't be the only factor involved in getting a problem prevented. It's perfectly okay. I think it's wonderful for us as testers to modestly and humbly say, I help people to prevent problems. That's okay. That's reasonable. We help. That's what we do. We're here to help. So let's talk more clearly about testing. Starting right now. Instead of verify that, superpower your testing by saying challenge the belief that. Instead of validate, think investigate. Instead of confirm, think find problems with. Instead of show that it works, discover where it doesn't work. Instead of pass versus fail, throw out the whole pass versus fail business and replace it with, is there a problem here? A product can be correct in many ways and still have terrible problems. And a problem can be incorrect in lots of ways and still be okay. Test cases. Let's think about test conditions and test ideas instead. Counting test cases. <laughs> Throw it out. Let's describe coverage. Automated testing. There's no automated testing, but there is program checking. Test automation. Let's think about tool-assisted testing, using tools in powerful ways. Use cases. OK, think of those. And misuse cases. And abuse cases. And obtuse cases. And abstruse cases. And think about loose cases, too, just so our use cases don't get too tight. Instead of KPIs and K-locks, lines of code, counting test cases, let's think about this. Let's think about learning from every bug. Let's do what the airline business does and learn from every bug. That's why the airline business is so fantastically safe, so fantastically competent. Instead of saying, we're hosed, we can't test, Let's say, well, what can we test right now? And by the way, this uh, business of the environment being unavailable, are you okay with that, dear client? They didn't give us good requirements documents. We can't test. We can test. Let's write down what we find out, and they'll tell us what they think is wrong. We'll find problems that they didn't know about. It's too hard to test this. Okay, what can we do to make a more testable product? We don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. 
What testing should we do? What will we cover in the time that we do have? And here's an important one for anybody who wants to be an agent of their own work, anybody who wants agency. And replace we have to. Anytime you think of saying we have to, replace that with we choose to because that makes us think about the possibility of other choices. There's one more tiny catch. There's lots of skills to work on, lots of things to study, and there's lots of tasks to perform in the testing job, right? We have to set all this stuff up, do all these things. It's a big, complicated job. There's lots of things to do. It's kind of hard, and there's all these other things that we have to do in terms of managing ourselves as well, but you know what? Anything that is worth doing is hard. Anything that's really worth doing has a challenge associated with it. So, to conclude, the good news is that if we study testing, if we talk to each other, if we practice it, if we practice doing it and practice talking about it, we can create a more powerful and more helpful craft and help our clients and our colleagues to make wonderful and useful and beautiful and helpful things. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Друзья, у нас есть пара минут еще на вопросы, поэтому кто хочет задать вопрос, пожалуйста, поднимайте руку. Вопрос нужно задавать на каком языке? Английский. Правильно, на английском. That sounded Погнали. good. Uh... <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. I shall just shut this down if that's okay. Yeah. Just like you wanted. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a really fantastic presentation. Thank you. So I almost agree with you, and I personally passed this uh, way from uh, thinking uh, about testing to quality assurance. But there is only one thing that I would disagree with you. So Only uh, one? <laughs> oh, that's no fun. <laughs> so let me explain. Yeah. Uh, so you just described quality assurance. No. Uh, no, I described let, testing. Let me explain you. So okay. Testing oh, okay. is the process of verification and validation. So when we hire junior test engineers, they don't know all these things. They can't know because they don't have experience. So they just start from creating test cases, analyzing requirements, and so on. But within experience of, uh, of past years and projects, they become not testers, they become quality assurance engineers. So uh, there is difference between testing, then uh, QC, this is quality control, this is the metrics, and so on that you told, and huge gap between these two with quality assurance. So in my opinion, this is all the quality assurance. And when we talk about the quality assurance, we talk about all these things. So the team, the scope, the approaches, the strategy, and so on and so on. So just about the terms. Are you, uh, uh, you're still parenting like it's 1999, I think. Here, let's think about this. Do you control? Do you control the schedule of the project? No. Do you control the budget? No. Do you decide what goes into the product? No. Do you write the code? No. You don't write the code. Uh, do, you, uh, uh, do you negotiate contracts with the customers? A bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I present on uh, pre-sales activities, so uh, when no, I do you know, But, but do, you, do you get to sign the contract? No. <laughs> do you hire and fire the developers? No. <laughs> okay. So just remind me how you assure quality. So yeah. So, so let me explain it. So I take all these limitations, all these things, and I try to invent my own testing strategy, taking into account all these limitations and limited, for example, budget, resources, time, mm. limited tools. I invent uh, this uh, high diagram, how in the most effective ways uh, to make the, for example, coverage and so on and so on, the, all these things that you described. So, so you want, okay, but that's okay. You want to be QA? Do you still want to have the title QA? Because you can. Yeah. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. Okay. Instead of quality assurance, think quality assistance or quality awareness. Or if you want to keep QA, you could also say questions answered. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> Agree. All right. <laughs> okay. It's great. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. And uh, uh, we can. Uh, I, I heard there's no party tonight. That's just not right. There was a party last night. Um, so um, uh, what I would say is, uh, I'm hoping we'll have a chance for another question or two. But if not, um, we will meet in the uh, Paulaner. I'm going over there after this because I am thirsty. Uh, and I also love to talk about this stuff with people like Mikhail. How are you doing, Mikhail? Yeah, I'm well. Thank hey. You. Um, I just wanted to clarify a bit the question of my colleague. We're actually yeah. working together. I think the main question is not about calling it QA or testing or whatever. Uh, the main part of his question is, as far as I understand, about junior stuff, about oh. people who come to the profession. Do you think it is possible in our reality uh, to implement this concept uh, given how m many people join the profession without this huge experience? Okay. How would you s teach them? Absolutely. And it's a great question. I'm really glad you asked it. Here's what I would do. Remember that testing is fundamentally investigating the product and learning about it, okay? So when people come onto the product, I want them, when, when people come onto the project, I want them to learn about the project. Myself, for example, um, I went to, uh, I described this yesterday in the, uh, going into a bank. I went into a bank absolutely cold, never worked in the financial business before, never worked in foreign exchange before. I had been to a bank, a few times, and I had some uh, experience with testing, um, and um, uh, so I was able to learn things very quickly. It was all about rapid learning. Uh, on the other hand, um, there were some testers that uh, we worked with. Well, they weren't. Uh, oh, hi guys, how you doing? Hi, uh, short people. I like short people. Um, the um, uh, the assignment for us, for James and for me and for our colleague Paul Holland, was to train people who were coming into testing from completely outside of testing. They'd never been testers before. It was our job to train them to take testing jobs, junior testing jobs to be sure, under the supervision of skilled testers uh, in New York City. Uh, we did six flights of this particular thing. I, I did one of them and uh, what we did was we gave them something really easy to test. Really easy to test. We gave them a kid's game um, that was just a little cartoon, a little bit of animation, and we set up the scenario for them. We said, there's a, a young lady who wants to get a job at a design company, and uh, the job that she's uh, going to take is as an animator, and she's got this little portfolio piece. It's a, a horse that walks in various kinds of ways, different kinds of pacing for horse. My daughter, four years old, had introduced me to this little game. And it's got lots of bugs in it. They're really obvious bugs. They're really easy to find. And so the testers, these new testers, they found some bugs. And they reported them. And their bug reports sucked. Their bug reports were terrible. So the thing we wanted to be able to get them to do was to write a good bug report about something recognizing that, it, uh, that if we gave them skills about how to model a product, how to um, uh, write good bug reports, uh, how to focus on uh, uh, things that appeared to them to matter and to use what else they were learning from around them to apply that, okay, so we gave them a harder thing next time. We laughed at them and we said, ah, those are terrible bug reports. Come on, you can do better. We challenged them to critique each other's bug reports, a really powerful way to teach somebody something, right? You, you get them to criticize the work of other people. And by doing that, they learn. One of the reasons I know so much about testing is because I teach testing. And there's nothing, nothing that teaches you more about a subject, in my experience, than trying to teach it to somebody else. That's the, that's the, the good fortune that I have in uh, uh, my role. But if you work in a role where you're bringing new testers in, Instead of teaching them how to do something, get them to teach it to you. They're going to have to learn how to do that. And they're going to have to learn how to do that quickly. Now, we gave them increasingly challenging work over the two weeks that we worked with these people. They also had uh, uh, 16 weeks of training in basic IT stuff. 
At the end of the first week, we gave them the assignment to look at a part of Microsoft Word that had a bug in it, had a set of bugs in it that I knew about. And we challenged them in teams, in pairs, to write bug reports on that area of Microsoft Word. We didn't give many uh, 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 specifications. We didn't give them many specific instructions. We said, we want you to go in there, model it, study it, and in an hour, we want you to come up with as many bug reports as you can. There were 10 teams. Me, on my own, Paul Holland, and the eight pairs of testers who were working with us, learning to test, first-time testers. I placed second in the best bug competition, best bug report competition. So it can be done. We know it can be done. And if you'd like help, we know how to do it, too. We can talk about that. Uh, but you don't get a, a, a learning by going through a test script. Nobody learns that. You didn't learn to drive that way, right? How do you drive? Oh, it's, it's easy to learn to drive. You just get that list from Google Maps, right? <laughs> you know, that's not how we learn to drive. We learn to drive by driving getting feedback from the car and getting feedback from the very nervous person who is sitting next to us trying to instruct us and by getting feedback from the road and the conditions and the other drivers, beep, right? And we very quickly, by getting experience with driving, learn to drive. So this whole idea about, well, you know, it's going to be three or four years before a tester can be a responsible tester. Well, it's going to take them three or four years if you give them a test script, give them a learning assignment. Give them the product and say, here's some resources. Here's a specification for this product. Here's the product. I want you to tell me about anything you see that looks strange. And then when they come back to you, they say, oh, I'm all confused by this thing. Then you guide them, you steer them, but you don't tell them what to do. By telling them what to do, you destroy their opportunity to learn stuff. So give them experience. Don't wait for them to develop experience. Give them experience. Give them easy stuff to test in a fault-tolerant environment, and then give them increasingly challenging work so they can take on responsibility and relax the supervision on them as they do that. And you will have excellent testers way faster than you are used to seeing. Thanks. <laughs>